remember seeing this table. You saw the table? I remember seeing this table. Okay, good. Well, I think I showed this table. I think this is about where we finished last time. Right? Okay. So, just to let's go ahead and just start at this point, talking about the way that we can use phasers to solve differential equations. And I I did point out I think last time um, that when we make a transition from the time domain to the frequency domain or the phasor form, we can transform the differential to the phasor form. And I showed a little example of doing that with the exponential that when you take the derivative, the, if it were e to the j omega t, the j omega would come down and you still have e to the j omega t. And so that's where this j omega comes from. Is we're looking at this as though we're doing derivatives of exponentials. And that's because, as I, I think I mentioned, that you will find, hopefully, when you do differential equations, um, at least toward the end of the semester, that what we're actually doing when we do a phasor form is something called the Laplace transform. When you do the Laplace transform, that is an integral transform where you're actually multiplying the function by e to the negative st and then taking the integral. So there's always going to be an exponential involved. So if we can just multiply by j omega to do a derivative when we're in the frequency domain, we can also take integrals. And an integral is the inverse of a derivative. So it also makes sense that the inverse of multiplying by j omega is dividing by j omega. And that's what we do in the frequency domain. So it's really nice that we can go from complicated derivatives and integrals to simple algebraic expressions. It's a very, very powerful technique. So to solve a differential equation like this, right, I'm going to transform each of the pieces. I think, again, I showed this um, on Monday where this integral sign would just become a division by j omega. The derivative becomes a multiplication by j omega. And you take the phasor transform of the right-hand side. So this is a cosine, so this would just be 50 angle, 75 degrees. And we know that omega is 2, so we would plug that in, and then we have an algebraic equation to solve. Again, very, very simple compared to doing a full second order differential equation like we did to solve some of the circuits in chapter 8. So we do this part, and, that, and this is the problem when I do this too many times. We didn't go this far, right? Okay, I thought that was where I stopped. So we've looked at RLC circuits, and we had our method of going through them, writing down a second order differential equation. Yeah, we looked at whether they're series or parallel, and then what can we do with that. Um, and in this example, for, you know, we have a we have a voltage supply in series with a resistor. That doesn't match one of our basic forms that we've learned how to handle in chapter 8, but you could do a source transformation here, turn this into a current supply in parallel with a resistor, and then it would be a parallel RLC. But it would be like the step response, except we never learned how to deal with sinusoidal inputs. All we could deal with was no input or a single DC value, a step. Now we are going to find out that with we can deal with sinusoids by using the phasor domain. But also, if we were to write this differential equation down, we would go through this um, doing KCL at the node and writing down an expression for each of the branches, the resistor, the current through the resistor, the capacitor, and then the inductor. We learned that we can transform, you know, we want to put those all in terms of that unknown node voltage. And we'd write down this second order differential equation. Now we could solve it using this Laplace transform method. We could turn this into Laplace transform by recognizing a derivative here yields, well, this is a second derivative, so it yields j omega squared. And then our first derivative yields a j omega. And then we could you know, solve this, putting this in phasor form. But that's kind of a roundabout way of getting to it. So is there a quicker or more systematic method for doing that? Well, why go to all the hassle of writing down the differential equation just to turn it into the Laplace transformed version or the phasor form? And well, yes, we can. We can do this in a much simpler way by skipping the derivation of the differential equation and instead transforming the circuit into its phasor form before we write any equations down. Once we've done that, 
then our RLC components are already in phasor form. When we apply KCL, we're just writing down the algebraic equation right away, which can be really nice because writing down the differential equation and then doing the transformation, you're opening yourself up to possibilities for error, right? The more steps you're taking, the more likelihood of, you know, something getting off. So it's a lot easier to do this from the circuit to begin with. And we do this by looking at the resistors, the inductors, and the capacitors, and what their current voltage relationship is. So for the resistor, we know it's IR. V equals IR. That's Ohm's law, right? When we transform that to the phasor form, V equals IR still. When we look at an inductor, V equals LDIDT, transforming that to the phasor form is just taking this derivative and making it a J omega. And then we've transformed the little i into phasor of i, right? For a capacitor, we know that i equals CDVDT, and so that one's easy to do the transform on as well. Just turn the derivative into a J omega, and so i equals J omega C times V. We could rearrange that to solve for V by dividing by J omega C, and then we have, again, an Ohm's law type of a relationship for each one of these components. We also can see that there is a difference in the phase between the voltage and the current for the three components. Resistors, it's just a multiplication. So the, if we were to look at these as vectors, right, phasors are a vector in the complex plane, then they would lie on top of each other. However, the inductor's relationship between voltage and current is that the voltage is J times I. Well, what's J? Right? If I look at that complex plane, where here's my real and here's my imaginary, where does J lie? Yeah. So here is J. Because J is just one on the imaginary axis. So that right there. So its angle is 90 degrees. So that 90 degree angle is multiplying the current. So the voltage is 90 degrees ahead of our current. And then this, the inverse of that applies for the capacitor, where I is J omega times V. So now I is 90 degrees ahead of the voltage. So we can say in both of these cases that in this one, for the inductor, the voltage leads the current. And in the capacitor, the current leads the voltage, or the voltage lags the current by 90 degrees. You heard of UI the ice man? Eli the Iceman? No. It's like an okay. acronym to remember each one. Oh, really? No. So if you have like E, L, and I. Okay. Voltage leads current and an inductor, UI. Okay. And then ice. So Eli. Yep. So you have E, e is voltage. Right. So yeah. So we don't really use that, but E is another another variable used often for voltage. And an okay. In so middle. voltage in an inductor leads the current. And then ice. And the inductor leads the current. Okay, and then ice. Current leads voltage and capacitor. And for the voltage. Okay. Just hacking my word. He was ice man. Well, it, okay. <laughs> nice. It does. That's good. That's a good way to remember it. So, you know, the whether you use a mnemonic or whether you just remember the basic forms, right? It is useful to remember which one of these is which because, in fact, um, we're going to show now that this becomes something called um, impedance. And when we look at the impedance, oftentimes we'll actually show. If I'm, let's see, it's not this one. Oh, here it is. Yeah, it is on this one. So when I look at each of the elements, R, L, and C, I, I have their time domain relationship between current and voltage. And in the frequency domain, if I solve all of those for V, this looks like V equals something times I. That's Ohm's law, right? And the something is the resistance that we're used to seeing. But now that we have all of these elements in this same form, we can call this impedance. So what is the resistance equivalence, if you will, of the, volt, of the inductor or the capacitor? And you'll notice in this case, we have J omega Ri, right? 
the j omega l is the impedance. But in the case of the capacitor, that j omega c is in the denominator. So its impedance is 1 over j omega c. And a lot of times we don't like the j in the denominator. And so we will rationalize this and put the j in the numerator by multiplying by j over j. So if I have 1 over j omega c, if I multiply by j over j, just multiplying by 1, I end up with j over j squared times omega c. And what's j squared? Negative 1. That's right. The definition of j is that it's the square root of negative 1. So if I square it, I get negative 1. And so I can put the negative sign up on the top. And so it's often written this way, that the capacitor has a negative j over omega c for its impedance. So what is negative j on our complex plane? 1, not on the x-axis, but on the y-axis. 180 degrees from this one. So here's negative j. Right? So that's like negative 90 degrees. Right? Which means going 90 degrees clockwise. So if I were looking back at this, in the inductor, voltage is 90 degrees leading the current. And then in the capacitor, voltage is 90 degrees lagging the current. It's back by 90 degrees. And that's because of this minus J. And so that might help you to remember that, right? That the voltage leads the current, meaning it also has a positive J. And that the current leads the voltage, meaning that you know, the voltage has a negative J relative to the current, right? So if we can use this phasor relationship now for a circuit element to figure out the current or whatever is flowing normally, if I, asked, if I told you that this is the voltage, 6 cos 100 t minus 30 degrees, and it's through a 50 microfarad capacitor, and I say, well, what's the current then? Well, we would all very quickly want to write down the expression for the capacitor, right? We would say, well, I know in the capacitor that I equals C dV dt. So let's take the derivative of 6 cos. Right? 6, and there's going to be the derivative of cosine is minus the sine. Is that right? And 100 t, I have to bring that 100 out. And then there's minus 30 degrees, right? So I have to actually do a derivative. Right? Well, that's not very nice. Not too bad for this, right? But um, it's a lot nicer if I can just say, wait a minute, well, I know the voltage is just going to be in phasor form, right? Six sorry, with an angle of negative 30 degrees. And I know tucked away up here is omega equals 100, right? I can just keep that in my head. And I know that the current, right, V is equal to negative J over omega C times my voltage. Sorry, current, wrong direction. Oh, is that right? Yeah, V equals, I need I. The equivalent of V over R, right? So before I, I said V equals, well, it just puts the j omega c up top, right? So then if I take this, let's just write it down. j omega times the 50 microfarad times c, or that's the c, times my voltage. Right? And I can just write this down as well. I know j gives me a 90 degree phase shift. I know omega is 100, and there's 50 microfarad. So that's 50 times 100, 1,000 microfarad. I can turn this, if I want, instead into, instead of micro, turn it into milli. So take the three zeros off. And then I can multiply this by my 6 
angle 90 and this is milla and then 30 I forgot to multiply by the C on this one, sorry. And so with the phasor form, again, there's no more derivative. And I can just work it out, right? It's pretty, it's pretty straightforward, just multiplication. Right. So this concept of impedance is again it's just extending ohm's law into the phasor domain and so we're basically just saying that the it, what we're defining as impedance just like ohm's law right where v equals i r if i want to know r right r is just v over i so now we're going to say impedance is just v over i whatever that is right and it's a complex number not r but z and it's made of two parts. There's a real part and an imaginary part. The real part comes from the resistances that are in our circuit. The R's, those were all real. There was no J in those expressions. But then the imaginary part is called the reactance. We use the symbol X. And that's showing us the effect of the inductors and the capacitors in the circuit. So now by just looking at Z, the impedance, I know what the effective resistance and the effective inductance or capacitance in my circuit is. And one thing that's kind of neat is that because inductors and capacitors have, minus, have a minus sign difference between them, if I look at an impedance, and let's say for an example that it looked like 3 plus J2, I could tell you that there's a net inductance. There might actually be capacitors in the circuit, but there's more inductance than there is capacitance. Right? Because they kind of cancel each other out. Right? And if instead, so if I were to draw an equivalent resistor for this, I could draw it like that. Right? With 3 and J2 as the equivalent impedances of each of those elements. And again, it may be this because it might have been originally. Maybe there was um, minus J for the impedance of the capacitor and plus 3J for the impedance of the inductance, right? And this becomes this for its equivalent impedance. So just like we did series and parallel combinations before, now you can do that even with inductors and capacitors and resistors all mixed together. In the earlier chapters, like chapter 2, and then when we saw it again in chapter 6, you could make parallel combinations of capacitors, or you could make series combinations of inductors, right? But you couldn't have an inductor and a capacitor and combine them together. You had to keep them separate. Now, a lot of times in the book, you'll just see a box. And that box will have the impedance in it. And you can do that as well. So if I have a resistor and a capacitor and they're in parallel with each other, I can put them both in impedance form, do a parallel combination, and write that resulting value in a box and treat it as if it were a single unit. So now you can simplify through parallel and series combinations far more complicated circuits than we were able to do before. So that, that kind of helps out a lot. And so this concept of impedance, you're going to hear it all the time. In fact, it's the more common way that electrical engineers talk about resistance. Even if it's just resistance we're talking about, we may just say impedance, right? Because imp impedance works for everything. It's not just resistors, but it's sort of safe to call something an impedance, right? Um, but of course, since we have an impedance uh, and it behaves like a resistor, we're going to measure it in units of ohms. So now the ohms is not just the resistance of the resistor, but we're using that as well to represent the total um, impedance. And its reciprocal is the admittance, which we use the symbol Y for. And it's also measured in the same units as conductance, which is Siemens. So there's a, a little summary table. Um, in fact, it's nice if there may be a table in the book, but if not, it's really handy to have one. And you're going to probably want one on your notes for the exam. Um, What's the element R, L, and C? What is its impedance? 
you might want to put in admittance or just remember that's the inverse. And then also what's its time domain representation, right? So you want to have all of those together on a table. That's really handy. So how do we think about the behavior of these impedances, these inductors and capacitances? Now we're talking about variable omegas. Before we were looking at them just in the DC. So we looked at the fact that an inductor behaves at DC, like when we were doing chapter 8. Right? When we were doing chapter 8, we had to find initial conditions, and we did DC analysis. And that DC analysis, we treated inductors as short circuits. And we treated capacitors as open circuits. Right? But that's because we were treating DC. Well, DC is just a special version of omega. So now, if you look at this impedance form, the J, um, sorry, the impedance of the inductor is J omega L. Well, DC is when omega is zero. That's what it is, right? I have a sinusoid, and the frequency is how many peaks I have, right? So the shorter the period becomes, this is, you know, if this is omega, this is omega going up, and this is omega going down, right? Stretches out that sinusoid. So as omega goes way down, becomes so slow 